And they were all so excited about working with these great minds and finding solutions to the most pressing social ills, right? And so yes, of course they were going to get jobs, but their job was gonna be to make the world a better place. This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana. This podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around the great state of Montana. We are proudly underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications. Hey folks, I know it's a Thursday, but we're bringing you a very special bonus episode today. And we're doing things a little bit differently, including some special guests here in the studio, and we'll get to them in a minute. The reason for this special episode is the launch of a year-long series on this podcast dedicated to Sea Change, an important and inspiring initiative launched here at the University of Montana this week. To kick off this series, we have Chelsea Bodner, a pediatrician and social entrepreneur, along with her husband, University of Montana President Seth Bodner. Thanks to the two of you for being here. Thanks, Justin. It's great to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so tell us about Sea Change. What is it and how did it come to be? So the Sea Change Initiative, and it is SEA, is a university-wide campaign uh, that's leading up to the centennial of the full ratification of the 19th Amendment in March of 2020. And so with this initiative, we're going to highlight and amplify uh, our existing efforts that we, uh, that we have on this campus to continually ensure a safe, so S, uh, environment for women, but, but also one that is an em- empowering through our curriculum, through our co-curricular activities, E, uh, as well as the, the efforts that we as a community are doing to accelerate, A, the careers uh, in, uh, of, of, of young women here at the University of Montana. Driving this kind of societal sea change you know, towards gender equity, I think, uh, means that this is a persistent and deliberate effort mm-hmm. that also seeks to make really concrete actions. So building upon existing programs that already are happening here that really do empower women is important and building and looking where we need to seek to do more. And this is this is amazing because it's going to require not just individual efforts, but really systemic understanding and change. Uh, so the sea change is part of, it's an amplification, but it's part of UM's broader commitment to equity for everyone. Yeah, and speaking of that commitment, why is it important for the university to invest, be investing in this right now? So look, we, uh, you know, we as a society have made great gains over the past century since the 19th Amendment became law, but, but we also know that a lot of work remains. Uh, 2018, many people called it the year of the woman, but the reality is that uh, Congress is still only one quarter female, uh, less than 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women, and we still have a persistent wage gap uh, across fields between men and women. And, and look, these disparities across gender don't just impact women. We know that including women from diverse backgrounds at all levels in our organizations leads to better outcomes, better problem solving. You know, study after study has shown that uh, diverse boards uh, lead to better outcomes for companies. Um, and, and so, in short, this, this makes our entire society better. And so, look, while driving a societal sea change requires much more than just a university, I feel we have a really important role to play. You know, I, I think Seth speaks well to all of the rational and systemic and important sure. reasons to do this. I also have just really deep rooted personal reasons yeah. why this is something I'm excited about. You know, I grew up in Missoula. I lived in Aber Hall when I was six years old and walked across this campus to school. In fact, my mom was the chair of the then Women's Studies program. Uh, and I want the statewide and national perceptions of what it means to grow to be a woman in this community, in the broader Missoula community, to align with the really great realities. Excellent. So what can we expect in the year ahead? So look, I I think the exciting thing about this is that uh, we're going to, in some ways, learn lessons uh, and, and perspective as we go. But to be clear, we want to we want to declare our commitment to powering a societal sea change, you know, not just aligning perceptions of of UM with the reality of UM uh, by making visible and elevating existing efforts, but but potentially amplifying those existing efforts through coordination and new collaborations, as well as identifying and bringing together uh, new and, and exciting programming, uh, raising awareness, raising funds in support of these efforts. And uh, and we hope this will this will be something that this campus can build upon, not just over the course of the next year, but but really uh, in, in, in many years to come. Super. Well, we're excited to uh, 
to be doing this at the podcast and really stoked about the year ahead. So in the lead up to March 2020, the centennial of the 19th Amendment, this monthly series will feature many important women's voices in the University of Montana orbit and beyond. To kick it off, we now bring you a conversation with the University of Montana Regents Professor of History, Anya Jabour, and Beth Judy, Montana radio legend and host of the long-running, in other words, show on Montana Public Radio. I'm excited for you to learn all about Sea Change and the programming we have in store this coming year. So let's get into it right now. Okay, so we're here today with Anya Jabour, Regents Professor of History here at the University of Montana, and Beth Judy, author of Bold Women in Montana History and various other radio uh, exploits around town. Ladies, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Great pleasure. So this is a special episode. We are discussing the Sea Change Initiative that's launching this week here at the University of Montana. It is, well, we've, we, in our introduction, we talked a little bit about what the initiative is, um, but it's prominent um, female leaders here in the state of Montana, thinkers, researchers, writers. How do you view this this notion of sea change and this initiative we're trying to launch here at the university? Anya, would you would you start? Sure. Well, I guess I would say from my perspective as a historian, uh, one of the things that I know extremely well is how long change takes and how many people need to be involved mm-hmm. over such a long time period for change to take place. And then even once that change has taken place to make sure that it doesn't change back to what it was before. Um, so I guess I see sea change as being the latest initiative on this campus of this ongoing struggle to create a more equitable society. Yeah, and sea change, I mean, this whole series that we're launching in the podcast leads up to you know, March 2020, the 100th 100, 100 year anniversary yes. of the ratification of the, of the 19th Amendment. We sort of think of these change milestones, yet a lot is unchanged uh, in those things as well. So in the conversation today, hopefully we can, we can get into some of that. Beth, so you're, you're an outsider to the university, but soon, soon um, and certainly part of our sort of thought community here. Um, how do you view what the, what the university is up to in, in this initiative? Well, I am an alumna, just to say that. Um, and uh, I love the name because a sea change really is something big. And that is what is needed um, for women in the United States and in Montana. So um, I, I, I hope it, I, I think it's great. And um, I look forward to seeing what effect it has. And uh, it's a great roll up to the celebration of the centennial. Yeah, so let's talk about um, the 19th Amendment, the, cen- mm-hmm. the, you know, the centennial coming up. Um, so the 19th Amendment, sort of commonly and colloquially known as women's suffrage, but not exactly. (laughs) Not all women, right? Yeah, absolutely. So some good, some bad. Tell us about the nuance there. Sure. Well, um, so part of the problem with the 19th Amendment is that the movement itself, the movement for women's suffrage, uh, was uh, dated back to before the American Civil War and initially involved a coalition of folks who were working to end slavery and promote racial equality and people who were working for greater uh, women's equality and women's participation. But that coalition really fell apart after the Civil War during the debates over the Reconstruction Amendments when the Real politique seemed to say to many people that they had to prioritize either race or gender and could not do both. Okay. And what that meant was that the movements essentially split, um, and African American women then were quite marginalized from the women's suffrage movement, which is one of uh, the reasons that uh, when the Susan B. Anthony Amendment was ratified, there wasn't really somebody in place to make sure that it applied (laughs) to African-American women. Um, And of course, because by the time of the amendment, African-Americans in the South already had been effectively disfranchised through poll taxes and literacy tests and uh, the grandfather clause or the grandmother clause, if you will, uh, that meant that while the Susan B. Anthony Amendment prohibited discrimination and on voting on the basis of sex, There were lots of ways that you could still discriminate against black women who were discriminated against by reason of their race as well as by reason of their sex. So 
you know, educate us a little bit on you know, how these coalitions sort of come together and fall apart. Because I'm, I'm curious as to, you know, the 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 notion that this this you got to split this up into parts, mm-hmm. do one thing at a time. You know, who decides on that, and then the priorities, and then the order, and you know, is that sort of a an effort to slow things down, or is that you know, how do these fractures sort of manifest? Sure. Well, in the case of the uh, debates that followed up on the Civil War, and uh, the common term at the time was that this was the Negroes' hour. The um, although both white and black women were very active in the abolitionist movement, the movement's leaders were men, and those leaders said one issue at a time. Okay. Meanwhile, the uh, white advocates for women's suffrage. Uh, were uh, sort of so unhappy uh, with their exclusion or with being shunted to the side in favor of the enfranchisement of African-American men, and so upset in particular at the fact that the new constitutional amendments guaranteed black men's rights and actually inserted the word male into the Constitution for the Mm -hmm. first time as a qualification for citizenship and voting, uh, that they they reacted very badly. Sure. Um, and so, and in the meantime, I, there were African American women who spoke up and said, "Hey, you know, we are here." Yeah. Um, and uh, Sojourner Truth very famously said that if if uh, black men get the right to vote and black women do not, uh, then black men will be rulers over the black women, and it will be just the same as we had before. Right? Essentially, substituting a slavery of sex for a slavery right. of race and several other then well-known <laughs> African-American female abolitionists also made this point that, as one of them said, we are all bound up together, right? It doesn't make sense to kind of parse us out because we are all more than one thing. We need to work for rights for all at the same time. But those voices were <laughs> ignored. Sure. Uh, those were not the voices uh, that prevailed in that debate. You know, in thinking about this, you know, some of these macro level forces that that Anya's talking about, Beth, your work is focused a lot on individual characters and their stories in this sort of struggle over the years. Um, Some of these women in in your book, can you can you speak to some of the characters you're thinking about and where they fit into this effort? Um, Yes, but I do want to just follow up on what Anya was just talking about, because, um, you know, we we also forget, I think, that American Indian people were not um, yes. permanently granted voting rights in every state until 1957. Mm-hmm. So it, it's just, just I, I don't think I knew that until I worked on this book, actually. Yeah, it's amazing. We have we celebrate all these milestones of inclusivity, but each time there is one of these sort of events, it does leave people out and and almost makes that more salient in a way, looking back on it. It's always complicated, right, to include everybody, and and sometimes people are not up to the challenge. I guess history shows us again and again, but um, it would be, it's marvelous when we do succeed. Mm-hmm. So, can you ask me that? Yeah. Question so, again? just thinking about some of these individual characters in Montana history that that kind of um, either were proponents of women's suffrage or or hey, things should stay the same way, but all sort of champions of of certain roles that you portray in your book. There are so many great suffragists in Montana, yeah. and of course, one of the the biggest ones that we all know is Jeanette Rankin. Mm-hmm. But it's neat because when Jeanette Rankin came onto the scene and she really sort of tipped the balance um, for suffrage in Montana, um, there was a there were um, like Anya was saying, you know, suffrage had been um, worked for in Montana for decades before that, and um, so she was kind of the the tipping point. Um, she was so such a mesmerizing speaker, as she was very charismatic, um, and she was very, very savvy, politically savvy. Yeah. But um, people like Maggie Smith Hathaway uh, in the Bitterroot, um, you know, Ravalli County was the county with the highest uh, vote percentage for suffrage in Montana, mm-hmm. um, and uh, that was because of her. She lived there. But they were across the state, the suffragists, men and women. Sure. And uh, so it's, it's such an exciting story. Yeah, and Montana's interesting. You know, this, the sort of state that can be the first to elect a woman to Congress in Jeanette Rankin, yet we haven't, I mean, she was elected twice to distant, I can't remember the exact years, was it 1918 and 1940 or 
It was, like yeah, it was in the build up to World War II. Yeah, was the second so time. spread apart, but still the only, a singular woman in that sense. And we haven't elected a woman to Congress since. What are Anya's ideas on this? I'd yeah, like to like, know. How She's does nodding. that kind of happen in right. a state like Montana? What does it say about Montana? Well, unfortunately, I don't think it says something about Montana. Okay. I think it says something about the entire nation. Sure. Because uh, Rankin and the f- very few other women who won elective office in the immediate aftermath of uh, of the 19th Amendment, or earlier than that in the case of Montana, they were the exceptions rather than the rules. So one of many limitations uh, of the sort of achievement of women's suffrage, or the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, was that women gained the right to vote, um, although it was qualified by race, ethnicity, nationality, even geography. But that did not necessarily mean that they uh, had equal access to political office. Okay. So nationwide, it was very unusual uh, for women to capitalize on their new political rights um, by seeking or being elected to office. So in that sense, I mean, Rankin is just sort of a, one of these handful of exceptions to uh, what unfortunately was apparently the rule, which was that women could be accepted as equal voters, but not as equal leaders. Okay. There was also this amazing progressive era going on at that time, which, so you have this amazing woman, and then you have this time that combined. Okay. And, you know, we just haven't really had that combination since, I guess, in Montana. Well, I mean, maybe what we're up to here can be at least some small starting point for something like that to happen again. It seems like, you know, it's, it's and I'm way out of my lane here, but, um, you know, in this polarizing time, it seems like folks on the more progressive end of the political spectrum are kind of getting more mobilized or, or sort of um, shifting the window of, of what it, what, what's included in the conversation. So. Yeah, maybe this can be a part of that. I don't know. What do you think? Sort of, let's bring it to the current day. What are we sort of experiencing right now? Well, that would be wonderful. <laughs> and I <laughs> That's really, an optimist view. And <laughs> I really hope um, that that is what happens. And there is a tremendous amount of political energy out there and a lot of hopeful signs uh, that – uh, you know, more women are are being elected to office, more women are running for office. Um, also, you know, more broadly speaking, that more people of color and more people with really, truly progressive agendas are running for office and actually gaining office. And that's marvelous news. Uh, what is less marvelous news? I love uh, that terminology, marvelous <laughs> news. <laughs> it's pretty yes. weighted. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what's less marvelous is that uh, currently um, in the recent elections, we're seeing some uh, kind of what I regard as a resurgence of the voter suppression tactics right. that were used in the late 19th century and early 20th century in the South to disfranchise African Americans specifically. Um, and now those Uh, sort of reinvented voter suppression tactics um, affect um, a lot of different types of uh, groups who are already disfranchised in this country. So rules about having a street address as a requirement for voting uh, have a very deleterious effect on the ability of Native Americans to participate in voting, as well as people who have no permanent have no permanent address because of poverty. One of the biggest ways in which uh, voters are, or potential voters are disfranchised now is what's commonly referred to as felon disfranchisement. Uh, Approximately six million Americans are disfranchised because of a crime in their past. And while some states like Montana re-confer voting rights immediately upon release from prison, many states do not. Many states require you to complete prison, probation, parole, Mm -hmm. and pay any outstanding fees, fines, or restitution. Um, And this can permanently keep people from ever rejoining the polity. And some people have even referred to this as being sort of a new poll tax. Yeah, right? in many ways, absolutely. So, I mean, the poll tax, formally speaking, uh, was declared illegal in the 1960s um, along the lines when we were having the civil that civil rights movement. Um, but there are ways that it can kind of creep back in. Um, and all of these things, you know, disproportionately affect 
poor people, people in rural areas, uh, African Americans, Native Americans, um, Spanish speaking Americans, and so forth. So I think that's where we are right now is both of these things are happening, right? Um, so there's this new surge of political activism and energy and idealism, and there's also a surge of uh, really horrendous voter suppression measures. And I think we, you know, we don't know yet right, sort of right. which of those trends is going to uh, win out. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, makes, that makes great sense. Beth, do you have a perspective on this as well? Well, I was just thinking, um, you know, one of the most amazing things about studying history, looking back into history, and not everybody loves history, but I think this is this is something I love about it, is just um, to see, you know, we don't, I think, I think I grew up with an idea that history is always progress, up and up and up and up, and improvement and improvement. And yeah. what Anya is saying is, is so true. It's just, um, uh, it's amazing to see things um, slide back. And I just feel, you know, we're focusing on women, and I really do feel that um, an argument for um, um, paying attention to women's contributions and trying to support that um, is that that affects and and helps all of society. We're mm -hmm. not just helping women when we help women. We we need to be a healthy organism, to be a healthy nation. Uh, we need to um, be including all of these folks and men white men are suffering just as much because of these, um, sure. this exclusion um, until we are a, a um, fairer nation. We're not, we're not going to be healthy. Yeah. And if I could just uh, jump do. onto that. And another thing I think that is a, a sort of a really magnifies the effect of empowering women is that historically and currently, uh, women have been and remain at the forefront of multiple movements for greater social justice for all, right? So, I mean, women were major players in the progressive era and advocated for all kinds of things that created a more democratic, responsive government, um, as well as better city services. Many of those same women went on to then become key players in the New Deal that established the fundamentals of the American welfare state. And, and of course, going back further, women were playing a very significant role in the movement to abolish slavery. And then, and then if you look at more contemporary times, I mean, it seems like um, many of the movements that are not necessarily about women, or at least they're not exclusively about women, nonetheless, women are at the forefront, right? So whether you're looking at women um, protesting, uh, Native women protesting pipelines um, across Native lands, mm -hmm. um, or you're looking at African American women uh, playing the leadership role in the Black Lives Matter movement or the Me Too movement, uh, African American women, again, uh, in the the Take Them Down movement, right, the movement to take down um, Confederate uh, memorials that... Yep. Uh, celebrate slavery. <laughs> women are at the forefront of those things, and those issues are women's issues. Clearly, women care about them, but they are issues that affect everyone. And so empowering women is good for movements for social justice because historically um, and currently, women are at the forefront of all of those movements. A New Angle is underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications, two cool companies doing awesome things all over Montana. Hi, this is Kelly Webster, Chief of Stuff at the University of Montana, and you're listening to A New Angle. It's, it seems clear as you lay that out there that you know, just including all humans leads to better outcomes. And, but but within that too, I, I mean, I think about this, and we, we had a discussion uh, about this a, a couple of weeks back in a podcast with three women that are putting together a women's leadership uh, retreat here in Montana. And you know, to your point, Anya, women have played such a prominent role uh, in in many of these movements. And, and one of the questions we we talked about in that podcast, from more of a business setting, was along the lines of, you know, a lot of times women are playing in a in a men's game or a game that's designed by men, whether it's politics, banking, whatever. Um, you know, and some women have proven that they 
play that game better. But at the same time, maybe we're not, maybe there's a different game we should be playing. One not solely designed by men historically. Do you think about that and, and kind of how we can look to the future in a way of like, let's, let's kind of redefine the rules of the game and, and how, we, how we're engaging in civic dialogue or how businesses are structured or how politics is run or whatever. There's a lot there. But um, how do you, you know, on your kind of nod in your head, how do you respond to that? Well, I think that that's been a really longstanding challenge, right? That, um, I mean, even at the time of the suffrage amendment, um, opponents uh, feared and supporters hoped uh, that uh, enfranchising women was going to not just, you know, empower women, but completely transform the political landscape, mm-hmm. right? Um, and and it did in some ways. I mean, polling places moved from saloons and barbershops to libraries and schools, um, you know, changing it from being, you know, really, really quite literally a boys club, uh-huh. right, um, to being a place that, you know, citizens without regard to gender could, could participate. But in other ways, those sort of highest hopes uh, did not did not come to fruition, um, in, in part because there was a, a a period of great political conservatism um, immediately following World War One that um, cast uh, women um, and more generally anyone uh, who <laughs> who wanted to change the status quo uh, as being you know communist sympathizers mm-hmm. who were you know dangerous subversives and sure. needed to be stopped right and so some of the some of the most hopeful initiatives were quashed uh, by the the so-called first Red Scare. So, and then, I mean, likewise, I mean, more recently, right, in in so-called second wave feminism, I mean, there was always this kind of split between kind of the the group of feminists who wanted to work more within the system and those who said, oh no, we actually need to change this system entirely and start from scratch. But frankly, neither of those groups were ever able to see their goals realized because again there was I mean that was in the 1960s 1970s and then we had the 1980s which were another period of great political conservatism right. so I think that um, in the past in this country women's movements have raised the question of how could we completely recast our polity but we've never managed to make it far enough we've never managed to keep the momentum long enough to find out the answer or the potential range of answers to that question. And one of the things, you know, in this this cycle that you're talking about is, is resilience, resiliency. And, and, you know, Beth, my understanding is you kind of got some, some – you've done work in this area and how many of the characters in your book have, have had to exhibit resilience on an individual level. How's that manifested, particularly here in, in Montana? Boy, you know, I was thinking about um, what um, what is special about Montana as far as as women. Yeah. And um, first of all, I will just say that having written this book and going around and talking all across the state about it, people love Montanans love women's history. They love their women's history. Okay. And it's because they, you know, they remember grandmothers and great grandmothers and their stories, and they're very proud of them. And I think that says a lot about um, Montanans, that we value both genders' history so much. Um, And I think that being in Montana, you kind of have to be resilient. Um, The land is beautiful, and it also can kill you. Um, And uh, we have a very small population. Um, So we learn self-sufficiency. And um, I would say that all, and with self-sufficiency comes a, comes a certain amount of freedom okay. when you have to take care of yourself. So I feel like all of the women in my book uh, have that freedom in them, um, which is, is resiliency mm-hmm. um, because they, they will take care of themselves. They will think of um, solutions um, to their problems, to their community's problems. Um, and they all did a, a, a fantastic job. And... I was thinking, actually, I have a banker in my book, um, Eloise Cobell. Okay. Um, and I was thinking earlier when we were talking about the game Yeah. Um, that, you know, it might be really great to change the game, but women often, many women would just like a chance to play. 
Sure. And when yeah. you talked about the rules of the game, I think that's the rules that are the problem. And often we like the game, we just don't like the rules. That the rules are not working for women. Um, the but, rules uh, deciding who gets to play? Yeah, who gets to play and yeah. then when you're in. Uh, you know, part of it is just there's a, you know, decades of men being in the positions that they're in. Yeah. And so things are done a certain way. So when other people, not just women, but people, all different kinds of people come into that game and they don't maybe know the rules. And so the rules have to change yeah. and that's uncomfortable. But, um, but Eloise Cobell um, is the last woman in my book, last chapter. And um, she was just such an amazingly resilient person. And there's, there's just example after example. But, but you know, she, she, um, she got in the game with banking. You know, the Blackfeet Reservation, they closed down the bank. People, people for miles, hundreds of miles, did not have a bank to put their paycheck in. Um, so she said, okay, I'm going to start one. Yeah. And so she um, started a bank um, on the reservation, and she had to do paperwork that was like, you know, a yard high. Yeah, Beth putting her hand up in the air, like three yeah. feet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she had to do such due diligence. Um, and it was funny because the government was not doing, had not done due diligence sure. with Indian people's money for 100 years. But that's what she had to do, and she succeeded. Um, that's just one example of, a, of a, an incredible woman in Montana. One of the things that you that you said, Beth, in, in the introduction, I think, to your book was about how some of the women are so impressive to you and they stick in your mind, not necessarily for their achievements, but simply for the fact that they stuck with it. Um, and of course, Eloise Cabell, I mean, does have very significant achievements to her name, but that really struck me um, about, about your book because, again, thinking about the the long-term effort of so many people that it takes to make and sustain positive social change. I think that is such an important quality. And um, I'm currently completing a biography of a uh, social justice activist who was active for more than 50 years, roughly from 1900 to 1950, and was at the forefront of multiple movements for social justice, for rights for women, for uh, protections for workers, uh, for child welfare, for African American civil rights, immigrants, civil rights, uh, and so on. I mean, the list goes on. Um, and, and would work for decades sometimes uh, to just get incremental change, to get only a piece of whatever it was that she wanted, and then sometimes see it overturned in her lifetime, and she still kept doing it, right? And so um, the process of thinking about and working with this woman's life really brought that home to me about how important it is. Just perseverance mm -hmm. is so important. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to believe that um, you know people have such such strength because it's easy. We we talk about burnout a lot today, mm -hmm. don't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. In my book, Alma Smith Jacobs is another one. The, her and Al Fabulous Eloise story. are the last two um, chapters in my book, and I think they're my favorites. Um, but they just were both such strong women who persevered. Um, Alma Smith Jacobs, the the um, librarian in Great Falls who became our state librarian uh, in, from the 70s into the 80s. Um, and African-American, um, born in Lewistown, and uh, just a, an amazing woman yeah. who worked for civil rights in Great Falls. That sure. was the other thing. Yeah. yeah. Let's, um, let's pivot and talk a little bit about the role a university can play in these sorts of... Um, I don't know quite how you describe it. It's not necessarily activism. That's not the right term. It's like cultural movement. So, you know, Anya, you described this. We're in this time where, yeah, there's a lot of energy, but there's energy on both sides. And the univer a university, I think, could and should be a place where we have free exchange of ideas and we can hash these things out with respect and you know, more speech is better than less speech, or more speech. The solution to bad speech is more speech, I think, generally. What role can a university play in kind of helping ideas like this take hold, shaping young people's ways of thinking about such things, and uh, giving them the skills to go act on them? So I guess I think that, I mean, a university should be playing a, a key role in yeah. all of these things. Um, 
in the progressive era that <laughs> Beth and I keep um, referring back to, um, which was um, the era in which the University of Montana was formed and also yes. um, other um, uh, great universities were formed, um, many of those universities saw it as their mission uh, to promote social change. Uh, the University of Chicago, for instance, had this, both the president uh, and the professors believed that Basically, Chicago was a social laboratory and that uh, faculty members with expertise in social problems uh, who could come up with creative new novel ideas for potential you know, solutions to those problems or even ways to prevent those problems before they started should, should take their knowledge uh, out of uh, the lab and the office and the library and the classroom and into uh, the streets of the city and the slums of Chicago and, you know, try them out, right? I mean, that, that, that was regarded really as the mission of the university that in some sense justified the rise of the research university in the first place, right? That's why you have a research university with mm -hmm. people who are um, not only um, classroom teachers, but are also actively engaged in the research. So I think uh, the that is that is an ideal for the purpose of higher education sure. that perhaps we have uh, moved away from. And that's and, very different. And we than really could preparing revive people it. for jobs. You know, that's oh very yes, different setup. I mean a completely different thing. Yeah. And. I mean, when you not read that the two the, are necessarily mutually exclusive. No, no. But it, when you read the, I read a lot of um, students' accounts of being at the University of Chicago in its founding years. Um, this is related to the book project I mentioned, and they were all so excited about working with these great minds and finding solutions to the most pressing social ills, mm -hmm. right? And so, yes, of course they were going to get jobs, but their job was going to be to make the world a better place. Yeah. I, I would like to just kind of look at things economically a bit, though. Sure. Preparing people for jobs. Um, I wish our economy was better here in Montana, although I do feel sometimes like that it hasn't been has actually shaped our values in good ways. Um, but I still want women <laughs> and families to do better mm -hmm. in Montana. And um, so I I would love my university that I graduated from, and that is the anchor of my town and my region. I would love this university to um, to do better by women and to help them become um, self-sufficient economically. Um, and because, again, you know, um, it's there are studies worldwide that show that when you focus on women, um, the con the whole economy of a country does right. better. And you know, and this is often women with families. So if you give women with families um, better opportunity, then their families go on and and do better. And I actually have a chapter in my book on the Women's Protective Union in Butte, mm -hmm. and it you know it was around for like eighty three years, and um, you know poverty is a cycle. But I feel like the Women's Protective Union actually prevented, they they interfered in that cycle for for many women because at that time women who Women didn't work unless they had to. And this was in a place where men were just decimated by mining. There were so yeah. many men killed every year. So women had to go out and work. Um, they could be prostitutes. That was, a, that was one option. Um, but most women did not want to be prostitutes. So, what, you know, um, so this union was helpful to, to women who were the lowest class of workers. So uh, including Asia, and also Asians were a low class of workers in Butte wow. and in Montana. Right, so some of these structures that have enabled um, better opportunity. Thinking about the university, Beth, you'd like to see it be uh, more of a player in terms of creating opportunities for women in our economy and fa women with families in our economy. You know, from your sort of vantage point as an outsider, what sorts of things specifically can we be doing better or should we be doing that we're not doing? Well, I think the sea change sounds good, and okay. I am not a I am not a university member. Right. So yeah, I, yeah. I'm putting I, you out, out of your lane a little bit. I but. want you, <laughs> I want you university, to um, to just yeah. I mean, there's lots of of things that they can be doing for women. Um, Anya, do you have specific ideas? You're, this is your world. Yeah, you're on the inside. <laughs> what can, what can we be doing better? I mean, you're you're sort of. Uh, 
I don't know if you're the director anymore, but at one point you were the director of the women's uh, sexuality and gender. Yes, I was. Studies? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's now the women's Did gender and sexuality right? studies program. Okay. But at the time I started in 1995, it was the women's studies program. We've, okay. We've we've undergone uh, two name changes and many more mission statement changes uh, over the Those over are the such years. Fun. Yeah. So, well, this is not an original thing to say, but That's okay. <laughs> um, I think that uh, we. We both, you know, the faculty, the administrators, the students, the community members um, can, you know, we can't highlight too much uh, the importance of having a truly well-rounded education uh, because as study after study has shown, right, people don't necessarily end up. I mean, most people change careers like seven times, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, people don't end up working in the field in which they obtain their degree. So um, clearly what that means is that the, uh, we have no idea what the jobs of the future are going to be. Um, and what we, think is, what we think is probably the direction is going, we are, I mean, we are almost certain to be wrong. So what we need are people who can, uh, you know, who can research, who can write, who can think, who can solve problems, um, wherever they get that, you know, wherever they, wherever they get that on campus um, is great. But, they, but the, you know, we need to be more mindful as a collective, I guess, of the way that a university education should prepare people to be really engaged citizens, but also be able to adapt to a changing world in the, and a changing economy. By the way, Jeanette Rankin majored in biology. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, there, yeah. the idea of focusing on retention and recruitment is, um, I don't know how we do. I, I know that Salish Kootenai College had a great um, focus on that in their nursing program, and mm-hmm. it was very successful. Um, I think if you can really try to give um, attention to people, that, that does help sometimes for staying in school and, and getting through school. Yeah, making it easier for the people that face a variety of challenges to, to stay in school and get through. Yeah. Absolutely. And by the way, uh, it occurred to me that I should mention, maybe uh, this would be a great venue, that um, Jeanette Rankin actually founded a foundation for women over 35 mm-hmm. um, going back to school. And um, it's, it's um, you know, she lived part-time in Georgia, so it's administered out of Athens, Georgia. Okay. But it's the Jeanette Rankin Foundation and it, it gives, um, it helps women out who are going back to school. Awesome. Um, well, in the year ahead, we will be highlighting various pieces of the Sea Change Initiative, either through stories about what the initiative's up to, or uh, guests we think that are particularly um, representative of what the Sea Change Initiative is about. Um, but it's been great to sort of um, put together a conversation with the two of you on this week where we're launching the initiative and yeah, Anya and Beth, thanks for coming in and um, really appreciate your, your thoughts and the conversation and I just look forward to the year ahead. Thank you. Me thanks, too. Justin. Thanks. Thanks for listening to New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, part of the Michelle and Lauren Hansen Media Lab at the University of Montana College of Business. Remember that this podcast was supported by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. These guys pretty much sell anything electrical you'd ever need, but they also hire a ton of our students. If you want to learn more about jobs at CED, visit cedcareers.com. Before we go, I want to thank some important peeps. Executive producer, Stefan Borsum. Producer, Aidan Morton. And interns, Aspen Runkle, Max Gibson, and Ellie Hanasek. Huge thanks to VTO, Jeff Ament, and John Wicks for the tunes. And finally, props to Jeff Meese, our master of all things sound. Finally, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at a new angle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word and be sure to use the hashtag a new angle when you do. Thanks a lot. See you next time.